Well, we have been on a series the last uh, couple of weeks on apologetics. And this morning we're continuing on and we're calling this message Life's Ultimate Meaning. And Romans chapter 12, verse 2 has been our launch pad scripture. If you want to look at that, you should have your notes. You can follow along up here in the PowerPoint as well. But we always urge you to bring your Bible. You know, even though you get your notes here, please bring your Bibles. We want to be a Bible toting church. Amen. So always bring your Bibles with you. This is the Passion Translation, which is a more modern translation, but I like this. Romans 12, 2 says, Stop imitating the ideas and opinions of the culture around you, but be inwardly transformed by the Holy Spirit through the total reformation of how you think. This will empower you to discern God's will as you live a beautiful life, satisfying and perfect in His eyes. So what is the message here? To change the way we think. Don't conform to the culture. Nearly everything we see in this culture around us is diametrically opposed to the purposes and will of God. So you, if you look at the culture and the culture is doing something, you can almost guarantee that God's will is not in that. Amen? Yes. And culture throughout history has always been the culprit. Whenever cultures do not conform to the Word of God, they, necess they naturally become ungodly. And uh, the, the, the sad commentary is it only takes about a generation for any particular culture or institution to fall away from God. I mean, think of our nation. This nation was founded upon biblical principles by people that sought after God. And look how far we've fallen as a nation. Now, we're seeing some good things. There are a lot of godly people in America yet. But, I mean, think of our, our schools and institutions. Look at, look at the Ivy League schools of Harvard, Yale, Dartmouth, those schools. Those were godly schools raised up to train ministers of the gospel at one time, and now they've become some of the most oppositional schools to the gospel in the United States, which is a very sad commentary. Nearly 80% of Americans describe themselves as spiritual, and then almost the same amount believe that God that in the creation of the universe. Yet among professing Christians, and I use that word professing Christians, among professing Christians there is an alarming number of people who cannot grasp biblical truth or what it actually means to be a Christian from a biblical perspective. So the last couple of weeks we've been talking about this quite a bit, about how there is a growing illiteracy among even evangelical circles, what we call ourselves Bible-believing churches, where more and more people that profess to be Christians cannot explain basic tenets of faith. They don't know what they believe and they don't know why they believe it. I run into more people who profess to be Christians who agree more with the culture than they agree with the Word of God. One of the things we have to recognize is that everybody has a worldview. And what is a worldview? A worldview is a particular belief system or set of values and beliefs that you see the world through. Um, again, if you put on sunglasses, those glasses are going to tint the color of the light that's coming into your eyes, and so you're going to see everything filtered through the color of those glasses. In the same respect, a worldview tints or taints, we could also say, whatever comes into our eyes or into our ears. Now, as a believer, we should live by what's called a biblical worldview. And what is a biblical worldview? A biblical worldview means that the scriptures, what the scriptures teach, what the scriptures proclaim, are a filter by which we see the world. Everything should be measured against the backdrop of the Bible. Now, we didn't get into it as much as I wanted to last week. I kind of got sidetracked. We're not going to spend much time today, but I just wanted to go back to that thought. Everybody has an authority. Everybody has some or vo multiple authorities that they go to as their bottom line. Who is our authority? What is our authority? What is the bottom line that we go to? Now, again, last week I mentioned the fact that many people will attack the Bible and say, well, the Bible is just a book written by a bunch of men. Well, I would, again, argue that every book you read is a book written by a bunch of men. The question at hand, is the Bible reliable? Is the Bible authoritative? Is the Bible accurate? Now, many people write it off, say, oh, the Bible's full of contradictions. It can't be trusted. It's been translated so many times. When people say things like that, I just check them off the list as stupid. Because they are. When you make arguments like that, it shows you've not done any research, you've not been honest and, you know, and truthful. Again, when we say we take the Bible literally, we do mean that we, we believe that Jesus was a real man who walked the earth, who really died on a cross, who really rose from the dead, who is really coming back. 
We don't believe that the Bible stories of the Bible are simply metaphoric as modern theologists or modern liberal theology teaches because one of the big explosions that's happening in modern Christendom in America is what we call liberal theology. And liberal theology approaches the Bible from a, what we call a school of higher criticism that came out of Germany in the 1800s and basically decimated Christianity in Europe. It came out of the Enlightenment, and it's this belief that everything, it, we should be skeptical about all truth. And so the Bible came under great scrutiny and great attack, and out of that, uh, that higher school of higher criticism came this whole school of theology, uh, uh, rather than accepting the teachings of the Bible, of criticizing, attacking, and devaluing the scriptures. Uh, it's a sad commentary that a lot of people go to Bible school today with a sincere desire to know God and to follow after a call of God in their life, and they come out of Bible school more agnostic than anything. There are a lot of preachers in America today that are nothing more than professional clergymen who really don't believe anything they preach. They've reduced the scripture to nothing more than a metaphoric uh, you know, book that basically is a bunch of fables and stories, but really isn't real. And, and it's no wonder, to be really frank with you, is it, it's no wonder that the churches that are losing the most people out of their churches are liberal theology churches. Mainline denominations, unfortunately, although there's some godly good people in mainline denominations, they've been struggling with this since the 1960s and 70s. This attack hit the mainline denominations, and what we're involved with, the charismatic, I came out of what's called the charismatic renewal, which took place in the early 80s. And uh, that really was a, a backlash in America against denominational churches that people thought had strayed away from the Word of God and become very lethargic, very stoic, and there wasn't much life in them. So we saw this great exodus out of mainline denominational churches into a lot of charismatic churches. Uh, people wanted to experience God, and people wanted to believe the Bible and be taught the Bible, uh, and wanted to grow in God. So we saw a mass exodus out of mainline denominational churches in the 80s, and really that's continued. Mainline denominational churches are, are dying in America, other than Catholicism. There are numerous mainline denominational churches that in the next few decades will not exist anymore. They're going out of business. But of those churches, and I'm not slamming those churches, I have friends who pastor churches in those groups, and, and I'm not saying all of them are bad. There are some really great Lutheran churches. There's some really great Methodist churches. There's some really great uh, uh, other churches. Uh, there are certain denominations that unfortunately they pretty much, pretty much destroyed their entire denomination. The Presbyterian denomination. The denomination of, of, of uh, Finney, the denomination of, of uh, Francis Schaeffer, one of my favorite apologists and favorite modern thinkers, the, this denomination that's pretty much completely abandoned truth of scripture and turned away. And other denominations have been the same way. But as I said, the fastest, the denominations that are the quickest or losing people the fastest are denominations that have embraced what we call liberal theology. Because after all, if you go to a church that doesn't really believe in the supernatural power of God, doesn't believe that God is real, doesn't really believe that the Bible is true, then what's left? You can get all that at a country club. So why bother going to your church? If you, if you have nothing to offer people other than man's intellect, you can get that in the world. Amen? So those are the churches that are losing people. Interesting thing, the churches that are growing the fastest around the world are charismatic, full gospel churches. In other countries, full gospel churches are growing by leaps and bounds, especially in South America. But Bible-believing churches, the churches that believe the Bible, teach the Bible, and uphold the Bible. But Francis Schaeffer predicted years ago in his great book called The Great Evangelical Disaster that it's the same exact thing that hit the mainline denominational churches would eventually come over into the evangelical churches. And we have followed, found that that's happening right now. We have ministers who proclaim that, uh, you know, universalism, like Rob Bell came out with a book, and I, I'm really hesitant to name names, but some of these doctrines are really just plain wrong. Uh, a book came out a few years ago called uh, uh, About Love and the Love of God, and basically said there's no such thing as hell, uh, 
and we've seen, and he's not the only one, there's a lot of ministers that teach universalism, that everybody's going to be saved, that all paths lead to heaven, uh, that all faiths are basically the same, we all just believe in a different God the same way, but they, under different names. This is all contrary to scripture. So we're seeing more and more evangelical churches, and one of the interesting things, uh, interesting is really a poor choice of words, one of the alarming things I should say, is we're seeing more and more churches preaching things or backing down from truths of Scripture where they're not preaching the Scripture. They're not preaching the sound, strong Word of God anymore. Uh, I was <clears throat> watching a, a, a video the other day uh, about this group out of Texas, and they've talked about how that the LGBTQ community has targeted churches, and through, the, through Planned Parenthood, they basically have designated $6 million to infiltrate churches in America and indoctrinate churches with the gay, L, uh, transgender belief system. So is it any wonder that a lot of churches are starting to back down from these things, and, well, we don't want to offend people, because the church now, just like the culture, has become very politically correct. We're so afraid of offending everybody that, that every time we say anything, oh my gosh, I might offend you, we might, you might not like me, blah, 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 blah. So we become a bunch of cowards. And um, so when I'm going back to, and go back to what I want to say, and I don't want to harp on that too much, you kind of know where I stand on all of that. But um, what I really wanted to go back to is, unfortunately, a lot of people who profess to be Christians, when you get to talking to them about particular worldview, world issues, they don't have any concept of biblical biblical values. They don't, they don't approach things from a biblical worldview. They look at the culture. And what I'm seeing and what has been happening, and this is exactly what Francis Schaeffer predicted, he called it an accommodating of the world. What I'm seeing is the culture is beginning to superimpose a worldview upon the church, and the church is bowing to the worldview of the culture. Whereas in years gone by, it was the church that told the culture, you're wrong. This is what truth is, and this is what we're supposed to do. The sad commentary is you can't get the church now to stand up for truth itself in an hour when we really need to stand up for truth. And one of the reasons we can't stand up for truth or not stand up for truth is so many Christians have lost understanding of what biblical interpretation means. There are certain particular rules that have been established throughout the decades uh, of, of ways to approach scriptures, ways to interpret scriptures, and if you abandon those uh, those rules of interpretation, you're going to end up bending the Bible to mean whatever you want it to mean. So the first thing we say when we talk about we believe the Bible is literal, we mean that we believe that the story of Adam and Eve isn't a metaphor. There really were two people on the earth called Adam and Eve, that God created them as the Bible declares. We believe there was a real flood. We believe that, that uh, the miracles of the Old Covenant really did happen. The children of Israel really did pass through the, dry, the Red Sea on dry ground. God really did part the waters. God really did raise the dead. Fire did come out of heaven and consume the adversaries under Elijah. We believe those stories are real. They're not just metaphors uh, to teach us about God. They really happened. That's what we believe. Which unfortunately that's becoming a shrinking a group of believers in America that believe the Bible that way. But that's not the only way what we mean when we say we believe the Bible is literal. We also believe that it's a piece of literature. And we should hold the same type of understanding and approach to scripture as we would any other piece of literature. If you're going to read a piece of literature or a textbook, you're going to hold it to certain scrutiny, right? The problem with much of the culture around us is they're dishonest in their approach to the Bible. If they would approach other books the way they approach the Bible, just like I said, when people say, well, the Bible's just a book written by a bunch of men. Yes, it was written down by men, but so was your dictionary. So was your science textbook. So were all the books you read. But people quote from books and scholars and authors all the time without any real knowledge as to whether or not what they're saying is true. They take it by face, at face value, by faith, right? Now, sometimes people think that if you're a Christian, it means you just believe in an ignorant, blind faith. That you just, well, you know, people, we hear this all the time, well, science is, is factual, religion is faith. And what they mean by that is that we really don't have any basis or any evidence for what we profess to believe. Now again, if you believe in something that there's no evidence for, that's ignorance. Our faith has to have some evidence. Now, 
in this modern world, postmodern world, that came out of modernism, that believed that science and logic was the answer to all things, and the world was simply a material world that had no spiritual existence whatsoever. I mean, that has been the worldview that's do dominated academia since the 1960s. That worldview of, of modernism and postmodernism, and now we're seeing uh, out of postmodernism came relativism and, and deconstructionism and all these, these beliefs that America is uh, embracing. And I don't want to get into that too much because I went into that in great detail in my series on uh, uh, politically incorrect. And, uh, but, but that's kind of where we've devolved to, and, and people have kind of bought this idea that science, uh, science answers all questions, but science does not answer all questions. Is science good? Is science opposed to the Bible? Are we as Christians opposed to science? Absolutely not. Some of the greatest scientists in history were Christians. We would not have the sciences. We would not have modern education. We would not have education in America. We're not Christianity. But unfortunately, in modern era, since the 1960s, even before, we have seen academia being taken over not by people of faith, but by people who oppose faith, people who are hostile to our faith, where Christians are being run out of academics, where people that hold to the biblical worldview of things are, are considered uh, outdated, are considered bigoted, are considered out, out of step with the real world around us. And the truth is, if you only hear one side of the argument, then that's the, you know, there's no opposition position. And this is the problem with our modern culture today, is so many people are only hearing one side of the argument. As if there is not another side. And so people just swallow. Well, yeah, I mean, we all came from monkeys. That's what science teaches us. We all came from primordial ooze over billions and billions of years. And people just swallow that without any really evidence. I was interested, I watched Ray Comfort's uh, video on uh, creation versus evolution, God versus atheism, and atheists hate Ray Comfort. They think he's an ignoramus, but rebellious, and we're going to get into some of the different kinds of atheists, but he went to a college campus and was interviewing young people that believed in atheism, and he went at one after another after another, and they, oh, I'm an atheist, I believe in atheism, do you believe in evolution? Yes, I believe in evolution. He said, can you give me an example of a transitional fossil, in other words, a fossil, an animal, or a species that turned from one species into another species. And not one of them could give him an answer. They said, I, I don't know of any, because there aren't any. There are none. Now, evolutionists will say, well, yes, there are, uh, you know, because Darwin's theory of the finches on uh, the Galapagos Islands, you know, one finch had a big beak, one finch had a small beak, and I'm being very simplistic. In the origin of the species. Even Darwin really wasn't an atheist. But all the things that they said, well, that proves there's a transitional fossil. No, all it proves is that when it's a dry season, the beaks on the birds get smaller, and when it's a wet season, the beaks get bigger. But they're still birds. An ostrich might have a common ancestor with a parakeet, but an ostrich is not a rhinoceros, it's a bird. We may have commonality with chimpanzees, but we have more uncommonality in our DNA than we do commonality. We may look alike in that we can both walk on both pine legs, but there's no, there's no relationship between us because there's no transitional fossil. And isn't it an amazing thing if evolution was so factual and these people know it's absolutely the truth, then why have we seen all these scams throughout history like Lucy and Piltdown Man and stuff were all concocted and been found to be false. Kent Hovind his wonderful series on lies in the textbook and atheists and evolution hate Kent Hovind as well. Um, but Kent Hovind in his great uh, series on lies in the textbook goes through and points out hundreds of lies that are in our public school textbooks that have been exposed years ago as basically non-factual but yet they're still in our public school textbooks as if they are facts. Now, I don't want to get into a big debate this morning about evolution, but I'm simply saying the problem is, as we see around us in this modern world, and predominantly because of education, because it is so predominant, this theory of evolution has pervaded our, you know, if you watch anything on public television, it's going to be all evolution. You're never going to hear a creationist point of view. 
If in our public schools, the only allowable, the only publicly endorsed and sanctioned belief system in our public school systems is secular humanism that believes that all that exists is a material world, even though most people in our public school systems claim to be people of faith. They claim to be people of spirituality. Eighty-some percent of Americans still believe that uh, we didn't evolve, that we came, God created the world. Now, they may believe in evolution. They may believe that, you know, the, the more modern thing that we constantly hear is that God used evolution to create the universe. Well, let me just, let me just object to that. If God used evolution to make the world, then basically you have to take the entire book of Genesis and rip it out of your Bible. Because you're superimposing something on Scripture that Scripture emphatically does not talk about. Now, we can debate about the six days of creation. Was it a six 24-hour day period? Was it longer? I don't really think, and, and I've heard both sides of the argument, and um, there's the young earth argument that believes that the earth is very young, and then there's like, well, that couldn't be because uh, there's just no way the earth could be 6,000 years old. I don't think those are contradicting oppositional uh, viewpoints. Simply what I believe is we're only given one part of the story. The Bible says the earth was void and without form, and darkness was upon the face of the earth. But you notice it does use the word earth. It means the earth was here. We don't know how long the earth was here before God said, let there be light. So the earth could have been here a long time before God said, let there be light. But the creation account of Genesis and the creation of man. We know man has been on the earth for, for a shorter period of time, and we know that most of these numbers that are thrown out, well, they're billions of years old. That is just simply not true, because there's evidence that dinosaurs walk with people. There's ample evidence. But you don't hear those sides of the argument. If you go to a park and you have somebody give you a tour of some canyon, I mean, we've been on these tours before, and some young college kid will be giving you the tour of caves. I remember we went to one place out in South Dakota, and we took a tour of caves, and, you know, it was cool under there, and the young person giving the tour, like, over millions of years, erosion ate away these caves, and, and you sit and you look at them and go, I don't think it was erosion. It looks like a flood to me. Because there's dinosaurs in North Dakota and South Dakota. There's so much evidence there was water on the earth. So we don't hear those arguments, and I'm by no means an expert on those things, so I'm treading out into deep waters, no pun intended. Uh, but I have listened to people that are experts on this and done a great deal of research. And so the point I'm simply making is a lot of people are being told things that simply are not true or they're not challenged. If evolution is so clad pat, if it's such an absolute scientific fact, then allow opposition to challenge it. Ben Stein, his wonderful book, his wonderful documentary, Expelled, showed how that numerous university professors that have lost their job, people that were Nobel Prize winning professors lost their job, or lost their tenure in public, in uh, state schools, simply because they said something along the line, well, there could be a designer. So there is an open, I'm not just, I'm just not making this stuff up. If you do a little research, there is an open hostility to God and creationism and the word of God in public schools in America today. There are a lot of godly people in public schools. There are a lot of godly public school teachers. But academia, especially what we call higher academia, which I really question that terminology anymore, especially with some of the stuff we're seeing coming out of higher academia, um, there is an open hostility to faith. Now, I don't want to get too bogged down in that this morning, but this is what Peter says in 3.15, 1 Peter 3.15, but in your heart set Christ apart as holy and acknowledge him as Lord. Always be ready to give a logical defense to anyone who asks you to account for the hope that is in you, but do it courteously and respectfully. Now, sometimes I have a hard time being courteous and respectful. But we're supposed to be able to give a, an, an answer. And this is what apologetics is about. You cannot defend what you do not know. Somebody asked R.C. Sproul, the wonderful Bible scholar and apologist, the difference between Christianity's God and the gods of other religions. And in a simple, profound answer, he pointed out that the main difference is this. The God of Christianity exists. 
That's the difference. And the Bible makes emphatic emphasis on that. It really emphasizes this. That's kind of ridiculous. Uh, the Bible emphasizes the fact that all other gods are not gods at all. They're the works of men's hands. Isaiah goes into great detail about this. Many of the Old Testament scholars go into great, uh, prophets go into great detail about this. There is evidence of the God we profess. Amen? So, standing steadfast in a world built on sand is not easy. We are seeing more and more young people shaken in their faith, about 70% or more of young people that go off to, to college within the first six months abandon their faith in Christ and turn to secular humanism or turn away from their faith in Christ because they are not prepared for the onslaught of attack against their faith. The one thing we have to recognize is we're living in a world that is very good at telling lies because the father of this world is the devil himself. We need to be better at telling the truth. 2 Timothy 1.13 says, Hold fast to the pattern of sound words which you have heard from me in faith and love which are in Christ Jesus. So the Apostle Paul urges Timothy to hold on to his faith. You're going to have to hold on to your faith. One of the common themes of the New Testament over and over and over and over again is hanging on to your faith. Hanging on to what you know. Holding on to the truth. Matthew's Gospel, the parable of the sower. When anyone sows, hears the good news of the kingdom and does not understand it, immediately cometh the wicked one and snatches the word out of his heart. These are those sown upon the stone. On stony ground. They receive the word, receive it with gladness, but they don't have much root in themselves. So after a while, when persecution, tribulation, and affliction arise, for the word's sake, get that, for the word's sake, they are offended and fall away. So what's the message of that parable? The message of the parable is if you plant a seed into the ground, which is the word of God, and it's allowed to remain there until it bears fruit, it will bring forth a great harvest. And he's really talking about our salvation. But you can apply it to multiple other areas of your life. What the devil tries to do is rob us of the truth of Scripture. Because the Scripture is, number one, our only defense. Taking the shield of faith wherewith we shall be able to quench all of the fiery darts of the wicked one. The shield of faith will not work if you don't have a knowledge of the Word of God. So many Christians, many professing Christians, are trying to engage an, animal, an enemy excuse me, without armament. We cannot beat the devil in an intellectual battle. But we can beat him with the truth. Now that isn't to say that there are people who are godly people that are not intellectual. Again, I've mentioned before, my, one of my favorite modern Christian apologists is William Lane Craig. Brilliant, brilliant man who debates atheists on a regular basis, debates and stands for the truth. The one I mentioned, R.C. Sproul, tremendous intelligent man of God. Um, just makes your mind bend when you hear him teach about some of the things he knows. Is an amazing man of God. 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 3 says, Now, brothers and sisters, let me remind you once again of the good news of salvation which I preached to you, which you welcomed and accepted, and on which you stand by faith. By this faith you are saved, reborn from above, spiritually transformed, renewed, and set apart for his purpose. If you hold firm to the word which I preached to you, unless you believe in vain, just superficially and without complete commitment. Do you hear that? This is the Amplified. I like the way it puts this. Unless you believe superficially, without commitment. A lot of professing Christians today, that's where they're at. They believe superficially without commitment. There is, uh, the Bible says, a, a house built upon sand. Jesus said, whoever hears these sayings of mine and does not do them, he is like a man who builds his house upon sand. And when the storms come and beat upon his house, he f the house falls because it has no sheer foundation. But whoever hears these sayings of mine and does them, he's like a man who built his house upon the sand rock. And when the storms of life come and beat upon that house, it stands firm because he is a doer of the word and not just a hearer only. This word will change your life. This word has changed nations. This word has changed continents. The United States of America is here today because of this word. This is the only reason the United States of America is here, because of this word. 
It has changed continents. It's changed nations. The Bible says in Hebrews chapter 11, verse, verse uh, 3, that by faith men of old uh, believed as they were moved by the Spirit of God. It says that the nations or the ages were literally framed by the Word of God. If we were to look back through the portals of time, we could see how the people of faith believing God and taking God at His Word literally transformed, established, and changed the course of events of history itself. Israel is a prime example of the supernatural power of God. God calls Abraham out of Ur of the Chaldean into the land of Canaan, modern day Israel. He says, I'm going to make of you a great nation. From your seed, all nations of the world will be blessed. Through Abraham, God predicts that the Messiah, Jesus Christ, would come, who is the most transforming figure in all of history. There is no person on the earth that ever changed the world like Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Praise be to God. Revelation 3.11 says, Behold, I'm coming quickly. Hold fast what you have, that no one may take your crown. So this is an admonition we see throughout the Word of God, and we need to take it seriously. We need to hold on to the truth. We need to hold on to the truth. Amen? The word apologetics literally means a defense. So when we're talking about biblical apologetics, we're talking about a defense of the Word of God, a defense of the Gospel, a defense of the Scriptures. Now, let me just define something. God doesn't need anybody to defend Him. This is why Christians don't kill people who disagree with them. Now, there was a time before the Reformation where Christianity had some problems, and they did kill people that disagreed with them. But we haven't seen Christians. Christians, as a general, we don't see, you know, you don't see a great uprising among the Mennonites and the Amish chopping people's heads off. Right? You don't see a whole lot of Lutherans and Catholics marching around killing a bunch of people today. And that's my challenge to Islam. If the God of Islam is so powerful and he is truly the living God, then why does he need you to defend him? Why can't he handle any scrutiny? Because in Islam, modern day Islam, Islam is not allowed questioning of their faith. That's considered apostasy. Now I know modernists today in America say, oh, you know, they always come up with this hogwash. Islam's a religion of peace and you can't, you can't put down a whole religion just because of a few radicals. Well then do that same thing with Christianity. But you know if Christians did the same thing that Islam did, we would not get the same courtesy. So my, my challenge is, if, if you compare Jesus Christ to Muhammad, which one would you rather follow, Jesus Christ or Muhammad? Muhammad, a warlord, a pedophile who cut the heads off people and had a little girl that was nine years old as his bride. Not a miracle. And no miracle, right, not a miracle, right. So I would follow Jesus Christ. So if Islam is the truth, then it should be able to stand up to the scrutiny that the Bible has stood up to. Yes. Amen. And so I don't make apologies for the Bible. The Bible can stand on its own. We don't have to prove the Bible is true. There's been people that have tried to disprove the Bible for generations upon generations. Whole major, major world rulers tried to exterminate the Jewish people. World rulers tried to exterminate the Scripture. Where are those rulers now? They're gone. Every one of them. No one will ever eliminate Christianity from the earth. No one will ever eliminate the Word of God from the earth. It will not happen, period. I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Amen. Now there may be times in history where tyrants and, and ungodly wicked people have overthrown nations and persecuted, killed God's people mercilessly and tried to eradicate the Word of God, but in the end, every single time they are gone and the Word of God comes back. Amen. And that will always be the case, even under the rule of the Antichrist. So apologetics means a defense, and it's used in Scripture, Second, uh, Acts chapter 22, 1, Paul said, Brethren and fathers, hear my defense before you now. 1 Corinthians 9, 3, my defense is those who examine me in this, and so on and so forth. There's numerous scripture where Paul uses this word apologetics. So the basic first question that we've been kind of dealing with in the last few weeks that you're going to deal with most of the time, the biggest issue in America and in Western civilization, you don't deal with this a lot in other cultures because 
Contrary to what modern atheists want us to believe, the world is not getting more agnostic and atheistic. The world is getting more religious. The world is the most religious that's ever been in the history of the world. People in other countries are not atheists and agnostics. There are a few atheists and agnostics. It's only in Western civilization. It's only in America. It's only in Europe where agnosticism and atheism has really taken foothold and really exploded. Now, I could say, well, okay, what about communism? Of course. I'm talking about right now. But look what's happened to communism. Look what happened to Russia under communism. It fell, and Christianity came back into Russia and numerous other countries. Now, I'm not saying it's perfect, but we're, see, we're seeing Christianity. The point is, there are hundreds of millions, there are billions of people, 10% of the world's planets, planet, or 10% of the world's planet right now are Christians. And about that money are Muslim. And then we have Hindus. We have other religions. So the world is full of people who are religious. People who believe in God or a God or a form of God. So the world is not getting more agnostic and atheistic. The world is actually getting more religious. Because most of the religions of the world are really growing. Because when people are hopeless and destitute, they want to believe there's something beyond the grave. And people say, well, you know, see, that proves that, you know, God is just a figment of people's imaginations. Well, even if there was no God, I would rather believe there was a God than believe there's nothing beyond the grave. Amen. So what I want to really zero on here today, and we're running out of time, unfortunately, but first and foremost, does God exist? And the next question, if there is a God, then who is this God that exists and what's he like? Or are there a plethora of gods? Are there numerous, numerous gods? I, I propose, and, and I didn't originate this, you know, I very seldom religi originate anything. There's nothing new under the sun, Solomon said. But only the existence of God really gives ultimate meaning to life. If we're really honest with ourselves, if there is no God, because this morning we're dealing with what we call atheism and agnosticism, if there truly is no God, if all there is to life is the here and now, this, sim this short temporal existence, this short, as, as Solomon said, this, this fleeting moment, if all there is to life is what we're seeing and feeling and all there is to this existence is a temporal, physical world around us and all there is beyond, beyond the grave is nothing. We die, we're dead like dogs, there's not a hereafter, there's no happy ever after. When we die, that's it. If that is all the existence we really have, then we have ultimately no purpose in living. No matter what we do, if we're really honest with ourselves, we'd have to agree with Solomon who said it is vanity of vanities. And that word means it's futile, it's like trying to hold the wind in your hand. Everything we try to accomplish in this world, if there is nothing beyond the grave, if there is no such thing as an afterlife, if there is no God, then really what is the ultimate purpose of life? Because ultimately if we die and that's all there is to our life, then no matter what we accomplish, ultimately it is purposeless. It's meaningless. And this is a great obstacle to the doctrine or belief of atheism. Because if atheists are truly honest with themselves, which they're not, but if they're truly honest with themselves, then really all of their screaming about the environment and how the world's going to burn up in a ball of fire because of global warming and how we're all going to die and starve to death and the, world's, the sun's going to burn out in 100 billion years. Uh, I mean, really, these are the things that they ponder about. People spend a lot of time thinking about that. And I'm not saying we shouldn't be good stewards of the earth because we are caretakers of this planet. But really, if there is no God, if there's nothing beyond my heart beating within my chest, when I die, that's it, bam. That's the end of my existence, I'm dirt. Then no matter what I accomplish on this world, it is ultimately meaningless, purposeless, and a chasing after the wind. This is what Solomon said in Ecclesiastes. He said, but, verse two, chapter two, verse 11 said, but then I looked at, I turned my attention to what I had done. In other words, he's looking back over his life. Who He accomplished a lot of things, Solomon, one of the greatest kings in the history of the world. 
I thought about all the hard work and toil, and suddenly I realized it was useless, like chasing the wind, that there is nothing to gain, no profit, no advantage from anything we do here on earth under the sun. And I mean, we just did a series on Wednesday nights on the great book of Ecclesiastes, which is a really modern existential, existential work, and, and basically existentialism is um, the pondering of purpose and meaning to life, basically. And so what Solomon was doing, he's looking back over his life, he was super wealthy, he had all the money anyone, they brought literally semi-truck loads of gold to Solomon's kingdom. He's the richest person ever lived on the planet. He had everything, he said, you know, I gave my heart to partying. I had women, he had 700 wives for crying out loud. He had, a, I had fame, people from all over the world came to hear the wisdom of Solomon. But everything he put his hand to, at the end of his life, he fell away from God in his wisdom and he became really a backslidden. He came back to God later on, but at the end of his life he's writing this book of Ecclesiastes and he's reconciling the reality of the world with his faith in Christ, God. And he comes to the conclusion that if you don't have God, basically no matter what you accomplish on earth, it's a waste of time. He says, well, you know, I've done all these things and... Um, I've got all this wealth, but it's a frustrating thing. It's a vanity. It's a waste of time because the next person that comes along is going to take my wealth, and I can't tell if he's smart or stupid. He may squander every penny I've got. So Solomon comes to the conclusion of the matter, the whole purpose of man is to fear God and to keep his commandments. Without God, everything we accomplish in life is meaningless vanity, a chasing after wind. That's what Solomon came to the conclusion of. No matter if you're really intelligent, he said the wise and the fool, they both come to the same end. Solomon said, I put my heart to learning. He found out even if you're super smart, very brilliant, in the end you're still going to die. The fool and the wise both die. So what difference does it make? It's the ultimate book of the purposeless of life, life without God. Because that's what Solomon's whole theme was. It's like, life without God has ultimately no meaning whatsoever. It is a chasing after the wind. And see, this is the reality of atheism. If there is no God, then no matter what you accomplish on the earth, it ultimately is not going to make any difference. Because no matter how many people live upon the planet, no matter how many people succeed you, eventually, 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 according to the law of thermodynamics, it's going to wind down into destruction. I mean, most modern atheists, most modern scientists believe that the human race will eventually become extinct. Now, we know that's not true from a biblical perspective. But we see more and more books about, you know, life after people, and there's been a lot of movies that come out, what happens to the world after people, and of course, the modern materialist worldview is that people are basically just animals, we're just a different kind of animal, which is completely contrary to scripture, because we're not just an animal. If we're just an animal, then we should take you out and quarter you after church and eat you. <laughs> but we would find that offensive, wouldn't we? And there are cultures that do eat people. But we don't eat people because we realize that people are on a higher grade than animals. And it just didn't come about because of evolution, it came about because God made us that way. Amen? You know, and I hope you're not a believe in reincarnation because next time you go to McDonald's you might be eating your Aunt Lucy or something like that. Um, <laughs> I can't believe I said that. Uh, so the question then remains, how do we know for certain that God does exist? Well, I want to just point something out to you. For, for a lot of years, Christians have been running with their tail between their legs, expected to prove the existence of God. You know, people will often say when you deal with God, and again, our, our, our purpose is not just to win an argument, our purpose is to win people to Christ. Now, I'm being a little inflammatory about some of these statements because I'm trying to just drive home points. But we need to be gentle in the way we handle people and, you know, we're not trying to be inflammatory, but I'm trying to really just eradicate some of these beliefs maybe from your thinking that have been embedded there over the years. And so I'm just kind of really driving these home. But for years, Christians have thought that the burden of proof of the existence of God is our responsibility. And really, it's just the opposite. It's the responsibility of those who challenge the existence of God to prove that he doesn't exist. And the truth is they can't prove it. You cannot prove that God does not exist. It's impossible. That would be like saying, there is no gold in China. 
Well, how would you know there's no gold in China? Well, the only way you could know that there's no gold in China is you would have to know, you would have to have all knowledge of China. You'd have to know everything about China, not just the people of China. You'd have to know everything about every mineral in the soil. You'd have to know everything. You'd have to have all knowledge of China to know there's not gold in China. And so for somebody to say there is no God, you would have to have all knowledge of the entire universe to know there's no God. And you don't have that. So the proof of, of burden is not upon the Christian or the believer to prove the existence of God, it's upon the atheist or the agnostic to give us actual evidence that God does not exist, and science does not give us that evidence. As a matter of fact, if scientists are really honest, if they're truly honest scientists, they don't come to the conclusion there's no God, they come to the conclusion that science does not answer all questions, and there's some questions that we just have to leave to faith or God. I mean, Einstein was not a Christian. But Einstein came to the conclusion that beyond his hypothesis, the only thing that could explain it was God. And brilliant people throughout the ages have come to the conclusion that God must exist. So many atheists, unfortunately, were at one time involved with Christianity. You meet atheists all the time and say, I used to be a Christian. Now, I oftentimes question what they really thought Christianity was. That's like a cow saying, I used to be a horse. <laughs> well, I suppose it's possible in this day and age. That'll be the next thing. <laughs> but it's, it's just simply, you know, we're, you either are or you're not. But a lot of atheists used to, grew up in Christian homes, but they didn't get answers to their questions. They got pat answers, pat religious answers. That's one of the most offensive things to me I think there is. And I've talked to a lot of people over the years that have gone to their priest or gone to their pastor, and their pastor gives them this stupid pat answer that isn't intellectual, and they're supposed to just swallow it, and they get offended by it, and they go, that, that didn't answer my question. Listen, we need to be able to answer tough questions. There's nothing wrong with asking questions. There's nothing wrong with challenging what you're told. We encourage that, but be honest about it. There are answers. And I may not know every answer, but we can find answers. Amen? Amen. Reasonable answers. So reasonable there are basically two types of atheists in the world today. There are reasonable and unreasonable. Now, a reasonable atheist is basically an agnostic. Now, in case you didn't realize it, the word agnostic is a Greek word that when translated into Latin means imbecile. Ignoramus, same word. An ignoramus. And basically, it simply means, I'm just making fun, but it basically means you don't know anything. You don't know what you believe. So an atheist is some, there are basically two types of atheists. There's the atheist who is reasonable. I call these people uh, agnostics. In other words, these are people that say, you know, I would accept the existence of God, I would accept Christianity if you could give me more proof. So when we're trying to share the gospel with people, we have to, we have to kind of identify what we're dealing with. When we run into people who are atheists or agnostics, we have to identify what type of atheist are you. In other words, if I were to give you proof of the existence of God, if I were to give you proof that Jesus came to the earth as who he said he was and did what he said he was going to do and rose from the dead and that the Christianity is true, would you accept it if I gave you proof? A reasonable atheist or an agnostic would say, yes, if you could offer me ample proof, I would accept that belief. Now, the unreasonable atheists would come to this conclusion. If I gave you ample proof of the existence of God and of Jesus Christ, would you accept it? And they would say, no. That's an unreasonable atheist. The Bible describes those type of fool people as fools. That's what a fool is. A fool is somebody whose mind is so made up it cannot be changed with facts and truth. That's an unreasonable atheist. Now, um, the real, and Frank Turek, the great apologist Frank Turek talks about this because he said, I've challenged people on college campuses with this, and he said, if they tell me, no, I wouldn't accept it, he said, now we have another problem then. The problem is that you refuse to accept truth even though it may be absolutely evident. So it's not a matter of truth, it's a matter of rebellion. 
and really this is where a lot of modern atheists in America are at today. It isn't a matter that there's not proof of Christianity. It isn't a matter that there's not biblical proof of the existence of God. It's a matter of you refuse to accept the truth because you're in rebellion against God. And until that rebellion is broken, no amount of reasoning can ever change their minds. So let me wrap it up this morning with this conclusion. One of the simplest explanations and proofs of the existence of God really isn't some scientific belief. I think one of the greatest arguments for the existence of God is that, what I just proposed to you, what is the meaning of your life if there is no God? Because one of the things that atheists will often bring people back to, well, you're saying, I can find great meaning by helping other people. Shouldn't we be good people? Yes, we should be good people. Shouldn't we help other people? That gives us meaning temporarily. But you're still going to die. And no matter how many people you help, they're all going to die too. And eventually, down the road, everybody dies. It's just a matter of when, where, and how. And if all we do is we live, we do a few good things and we die, ultimately, then it is a chasing after the wind. And ultimately, your good deeds are no better than somebody's bad deeds. Because you might look at a puppy and say, oh, puppies are good. Beautiful, cute little puppy, they're good. Or a kitten, good. But those same, you know, cute little kitten grows up into a cat and eats bird, eats mice, just dismembers them. You might look at them and they're good. You might look at a crocodile and say, oh, that's bad. Says who? This crocodile's just doing its thing. You get too close to the water, it's going to grab you and drag you and eat you. Puppy and all, you know? <laughs> you know, because we're wired that way. I see, you know, a leopard swimming in the water and the crocodile comes and eats the leopard, drags him out and eats him. I go, oh, poor leopard, you know. Well, what do you mean? The crocodile's just doing his deal, man, you know. So the point is, I think that's a good argument to propose to people. I don't get in, I try to avoid scientific arguments with people because I'm not a scientist and I'm not an atheist and I'm not an evolutionist and I'm not expert in those things. But I think one thing that does cut through all of that nonsense about, well, proof of fossils and all that stuff, because I'm going to lose that argument. Because a lot of people are smarter than I am, especially when it comes to areas of science. But I can cut through all of that and say, so in the end, what difference does it make? See, what I want to confront people with is their death. Stop conning yourself. You're going to die. I don't care how many PhDs you have behind your name. That's not going to matter when you're dead. It's, we're going to go to your funeral, sing songs, cry a little bit, and then we're going to forget about you. <laughs> They'll put a plaque on the wall. Here was so-and-so. He's dead now. He's dirt. I mean, if that, that's our claim to fame, we've got a plaque on the wall, we're dirt. Got a monument somewhere, we're dirt. People remember you, you're still dirt. I don't care how much people remember you and laud your name, you are dirt. If that's all there is, that's pretty bad. Amen? I want to believe that my life is more than dirt. Because that gives me hope. Amen? But let's wrap this up. I said I was going to wrap it up. Every painting has a painter. Every building has a builder, a designer. Every watch has a watchmaker. It is basically unintelligent to look at a great work of art and imagine that that work of art somehow over a great amount of time evolved into that masterpiece. That is unintelligent. It is unintelligent to go into a museum and look at these great works of art that were put together by painters and imagine that somehow if you just gave them enough time and enough mutation and enough certain elements that that painting could somehow paint itself or that an intricate watch could somehow make itself or a building could design and build itself. That is very simple. Of course, oh, that's just a simple retarded ar argument. But it's a logical argument. It's an intelligent argument. If there's a painter, your mind naturally says there's a painter. If there's a painter, your mind tells you there's a painter. If there's a watch, your mind tells you there was a watchmaker. And the great brilliant scientist Richard Dawkins, bless his darling heart, he tries to say that your mind may tell you there's a watch, but there is actually no watchmaker. Your mind may tell you that there's a watchmaker, but there's really no watchmaker. That's not intelligent. It's not reasonable. It's not smart. It's a stupid argument. So, what is the proof of creation? What is the proof of the existence of the world? The world is by far 
exponentially more complex than a painting or a watch or an automobile or a building. It's amazing. And we're, yet, we're told that over billions of years through random mutation and simple chance that all of the intricacy of the planet and all the intricacy of existence of life and all of the existence of, of these intricate things that we see in creation that, or in existence that they simply came about by random mutation over time and, and, and that we're to believe this, to me that occurs a great amount of faith. It's not intelligent. Doesn't it make much more sense to believe, sense to believe in all powerful, supernatural, someone who is above creation, supersedes creation, who knows everything, wouldn't it make more sense logically, intelligently, to believe that he or this being created and designed the universe and brought it into existence? What's so hard to believe about that? Why, does that, why is that so hard? Oh, that, well, you know, scientists for years believed that the universe was just static. It had always been there. Where did it come from? Well, we don't have to explain that. It's always been there. But it had to have a beginning. No, it's always been there. And then Hubble came along, invented his Hubble telescope, and proved it hasn't always been there. It came from a specific point, and it's expanding. And so Hubble, and those who followed Hubble, said, could it be that the theologians have been right all along? So the point is, if we're honest with ourselves, all of evolution, all of, all of science really doesn't point to evolution. S science does not point away from God. Science points to God. That's what it does. Amen. So we're not against science. We're against dumb science. <laughs> we're against denial science. So praise be to God. So I just gave you a little tidbit this morning, and I'm sure you'll take that and make it much more genteel than I presented to you. So <laughs> praise God. Uh, so glory to God. Father, we thank you this morning for the Word of God, the truth of God. We thank you, Father, that we will know the truth, and the truth will set us free. We glorify and worship you. Why don't you stand your feet? I will pray over you this morning. Bless you. Oh, hallelujah. Avail yourself to some of these resources. We're going to put together a resource list for you and some stuff that you can use. Father God, I just pray for every person here. I pray that the word of God will go deep down in the heart of every hearer. It will not return void, but it will prosper what you please. It will accomplish what you sent it to do. May the Lord bless you. May the Lord keep you. May the Lord be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and cause his face and grace to shine upon you. May the Lord bless you coming in and bless you going out. May you possess the gates of your enemy. May they rise up against you one way and flee from you seven ways. We bless you in the name of Jesus. Have a wonderful week. We love you so much and uh, blessings on you. You're dismissed.